It's July 15th, 1978. Garfield eats lasagna for the first time. Time shifts, if ever so slightly. It's now July 27th. John can't find his pipe. Garfield has it. Garfield is smoking John's pipe. It's June 16th, 2009. Garfield has just met his dimensional counterpart, a version of himself from a universe where he is a superhero. They have to work together to save both of their worlds. August, 1978. Garfield kicks Odie. June, 2009. Garfield holds a woman at gunpoint. When did this start? When will it end? Only Jim knows. And he will never tell. Garfield movies are weird. Have you noticed this? So about a year ago, I did a video on the Garfield comic and how I loved it growing up. It's deadpan humor and it's hilarious characters. And yet, how over the years, its longevity and focus on marketing had turned it into the artistic equivalent of something on the back of a cereal box. Now, I did not expect this video to do well. I sort of did it as a filler video, but much to my surprise, people really, really loved it. And in fact, it became one of my most popular uploads, getting over a million views. But it's honestly not the view count that made me so happy. What made me so happy just was the kind of support I got. The support that I usually don't get on this channel. Friends I knew in high school called me up to talk about this video I had made. Uh, old teachers who had taught me, they told me that they had watched the video with their daughters. And that sort of stuff is so beautiful to me. And it's the, the sort of stuff that I don't usually get on this channel because my content is so niche and specific. I think my favorite repercussion of uploading that video was that directly after that, Ego Raptor, aka Aaron Hansen, subscribed to me on YouTube, and directly after that, Danny and Aaron ended up doing a lot of Garfield Let's Plays on Game Grumps. And in many points in those Let's Plays, it sort of felt like Aaron had definitely seen my video and was paraphrasing my opinions in his own words. I feel like I feel like a Garfield video game in general is sort of like betrays what Garfield is. Cause uh, he's, he just, he's, he doesn't like doing anything. That's huh. sort of the whole point of his character. Danny and Aaron are two of the best boys on the internet, and just the thought that my silly video about a newspaper comic I grew up loving somehow influenced one of my favorite YouTube shows? That's why I do this. For real. So I thought for this video we could do a similar idea, but instead of analyzing all of the Garfield comics, we could analyze Garfield movies. And now obviously in this video we're going to cover a lot of the same ground in terms of my opinion on the character, but we're going to get a chance to take a deep dive at really obscure weird Garfield media, and I feel like you guys will like that. So uh, here we go! This video is brought to you thanks to today's sponsor, Verve. Verve is a multi-channel streaming site that allows you to watch an endless amount of content from a multitude of sources. Verve has proved extremely useful for this video, as it hosts not only numerous Garfield films, but also the classic TV series Garfield and Friends, which is truly one of the best takes on the character outside of the comics. However, what caught my eye much more than this is the inclusion of Nickelodeon Splat and Boomerang which allow you to stream classic shows like The Wild Thornberries, Courage the Cowardly Dog, Rocco's Modern Life, and Too Many Incarnations of Scooby-Doo to count. And the app also includes offline viewing, meaning you can download and watch some of your favorite shows no matter where you are. And if you go to verve.co slash quentin or click the link in the description now, you'll get this service totally free for 30 days. Once again, that's vrv.co slash q-u-i-n-t-o-n. With that... I think it's time to talk about some Garfield movies. The story of Garfield starts out in the 1970s, as Jim Davis created the comic after numerous failures to break into the medium. Davis has been very open about the fact that Garfield was essentially him selling out, as he was tired of finding lackluster success and wanted to make it big while also being able to create art. Garfield was his big chance to do that, and through the 1980s, he began working with CBS to make a series of Garfield tie-in films intended for television. These were very well received and were consistently nominated for Emmy after Emmy, but Davis wanted more. Jim Davis decided to write a fully cinematic feature to be released in the theater called Garfield Judgment Day. It would be all about 
Odie and Garfield trying to survive the apocalypse, the end of the world, something that could wipe out their town entirely. And additionally, they become conflicted over whether or not they should break animal law by talking to humans. Now, I know immediately a lot of you guys are going to say, Quentin, that doesn't sound like a real movie. And you're right, because Jim Davis wanted to make that movie, but no one else did. Davis literally worked on this film on and off for years and tried to get it greenlit everywhere and just couldn't. According to one documentary, he even allegedly recorded all of the audio for the movie and was just waiting for money to animate it. And after years and years of failure and losing thousands of dollars, he eventually decided to release this. This is a short children's book adaptation of a movie that was never made. It's like a sacred relic from the Bernstein universe. Garfield's Judgment Day features Garfield and Odie going about their regular lives, running around the house and outside, when they suddenly sense that something is wrong. All of the animals in the town sense that a massive storm is coming that will destroy everything, and that if they don't do something, they'll all be killed. The movie would have then acted on B-movie logic, where all of the animals have the ability to talk but choose not to because of some animal law. But because talking to their owners is the only way to save them, they all run home and tell the humans to seek shelter. There's a lot of weird moments in this book that feel like the writer trying to make the franchise sort of edgy. Like, did you know that fan favorite character Arlene is homeless? Wow, thanks for that intense lore, Jim. The movie would have also featured very upsetting scenes of a storm ravaging this town, destroying everything, and even a scene where it seems like a dog has been crushed by this rubble and is dead. There's this particularly upsetting moment where all the characters are taking shelter in this theater, and the roof is ripped off in an instant like a can of sardines, and suddenly everything goes black. All the characters survive, of course, but when they get home, they discover that their house has been totally crushed. They are now homeless. This is how the movie ends. Garfield's Judgment Day is the perfect example of what's wrong with Garfield movies. Already with what we have here, this is too much for Garfield to handle as a character. It doesn't feel natural for him to be reacting to and caring about all of these things. Yet, at the same time, it sort of doesn't feel like a finished movie. It feels like 10% of B-movie, you know what I mean? It's missing some arcs. So it's too much for Garfield, but it's not enough to be a movie you would remember. The story is that Davis would go from company to company, Disney, Fox, you name it. He would ask them if they wanted to make a Garfield movie, they would say yes, and then he would show them the script, and they would say that they were no longer interested because the script was just too weird. And that sounds about right. I guess since we're in the era of Garfield TV specials, we should probably stop and actually talk about one. And since we're discussing weird Garfield movies, it probably would make sense if we talked about Garfield, His Nine Lives. Garfield, His Nine Lives was a book published by Paws Incorporated in 1984. The book was a what-if collection of stories intended to be the adventures of all of Garfield's nine lives, his most recognizable being the next to last. The idea is that cats are reincarnated between different worlds each time that they die, and that all of these previous lives that Garfield has lived unknowingly impact who he is today. The book was later adapted into a television film, which is the main reason that we're talking about it today. I ordered this DVD with a couple other things I needed, and it arrived in the same box of my copy of The Conquest of Bread, and I struggled for a while on deciding which of these I should look into first, and I eventually decided to do them both at once, and you would be surprised how thematically similar these two products are. Elaborate on that. No. Both versions of Nine Lives are very famous and infamous. Some parts, like the Caveman Cat segment that imagines many elements of the series at the dawn of man, are still considered to be very beloved takes on the Garfield lore. Others are less worshipped. The most infamous of these featuring a life where Garfield felt himself being taken over by a dark and mysterious force that regressed him into animalistic impulses before he attacked his owner. It's implied that he legitimately kills this old lady. This is Garfield's official origin story. He did this, and then he was immediately reincarnated into a fat dude that hates Mondays. Out of all the TV specials made for Garfield, Nine Lives seems to be the least praised, and I think it deserves that. Watching through it, it's so very unspectacular and unnotable. They chose not to adapt the real bizarre or shocking segments, which I guess was a good choice, but it sort of takes the oomph out of the whole gimmick. At the very best, the special can prove to be strange enough that you just sit there staring, not really sure what's going on. And at its worst, it's just very predictable and dull. 
Perhaps the strangest of these is The Garden, which is basically like if a three-year-old was expected to explain her understanding of what the Garden of Eden was. It's this strange Wonderland story written as a long poem, voiced by a woman trying to audition for a My Little Pony commercial. The longer it runs, just the more strange it feels to watch. Designed into the garden were things like tubes, globes, and orbs of the bubble and vinyl persuasion. The hovering harmonica, the skimming disc made shimmer. This is a purely concentrated representation of the side of 80s media that no one is nostalgic for. It's gaudy and weird and I hate it. The main segment I really like is adapted straight from the book and it's called Lab Animal. It's this very shocking story about an orange lab cat that escapes after being experimented on, and is pushed to the limits as it tries to survive while being hunted by government agencies. Eventually their experiments start to take effect and his body stretches and morphs as he screams in pain, but as he opens his eyes he realizes that he's turned into the exact same kind of dog that's been chasing him through the night. And that's the story of why Garfield likes lasagna. The final segment features a preview of what Garfield's next and final life will be, showing a more evolved cat piloting a spaceship in the far future. Considering that this was intended to be Garfield's future, it's a little funny that this is indeed where the brand ended up going. This is a transition into another part of the video. The direct-to-DVD trilogy of Garfield movies, starting with Garfield Gets Real, are perhaps the most pressing and worthy of being discussed in this video, but I have nothing to say about them. So I thought I could bring on a guest for this video to help me in this escapade of Garfield reviews. So I want you guys to all welcome Wyatt Duncan, aka Garf Gab. Garf Gab is Wyatt's series where he reviews Garfield and Friends one episode at a time every week. Why he does this, I'm not really sure. I presume that he hates himself. It suffice to say that there's no one on the earth that knows more about Garfield and fine art than Wyatt. So take it away, man. Thank you, Quentin. I do hate myself. <clears throat> the superhero medium has changed quite a lot throughout the years. We've come a long way from believing that Christopher Reeve could fly back in 1978. There have been highs and lows, but nothing can compare to a recent cinematic feat that took the superhero world by storm. It received universal critical acclaim and broke numerous financial records. It set the bar for any superhero installments for years to come. I'm of course referring to the groundbreaking blockbuster, Garfield's Pet Force. Released in 2009, this directed DVD classic was the third and final film in the 3D animated Garfield trilogy. It was also notable for being the culmination of 11 years of buildup that started in 1998 with the release of the Garfield's Pet Force graphic novels. 11 years of character development and hype from the fandom, all leading up to this grand finale. And boy was it worth it. We were clamoring for all of our favorite heroes to finally meet and fight alongside one another, and Garfield's Pet Force gave it to us. Fans were frothing at the mouth to see Garzuka and Starlina on screen for the first time ever, odious and abnormal stopping villainy, and Emperor John's quest to find a wife. Not to mention witnessing the most powerful villain in the Garfield cinematic universe so far, Vetvix. Vetvix is mad with power, striving for universal domination. She achieves her goal using her all-powerful infinity gem that she dons on her headband. This storyline is based on the legendary Klopman saga from the original graphic novel series, which revolves around the pet force trying to keep Vetvix from acquiring the Klopman diamond. When she reveals herself to be the ultimate threat, it's up to our noble pet force to band together and do whatever it takes to save all living things throughout the universe. Garfield's pet force broke new ground in this epic franchise by introducing interdimensional space travel by Garzuka, who has been tasked with keeping the Klopman Diamond out of the hands of Vetvix. 
He travels to our timeline and meets the Pet Force Earth counterparts, which leads to many great moments of fan service that will satisfy any Garfield Cinematic Universe fan. It's an epic tale of bravery, failure, and the ultimate sacrifice. It gives these wonderful characters the noble end that they deserve. It was such a bold choice to end this action-packed film on a shot of Garfield and Arlene dancing, which closes this trilogy out with a heartfelt feeling of romance and nostalgia. Needless to say, Garfield's Pet Force was a game changer. It took the world by storm and completely revolutionized the superhero genre. People never thought that a payoff 11 years in the making would be this satisfying, but it delivered on every level. Its direct-to-DVD worldwide gross amounted to $10,918,505, just barely eclipsing the sales of Titanic VHS tapes sold on eBay that year. As a film historian, Garfield's Pet Force holds a very special place in my heart for its contributions to the cinema landscape. I've been trying relentlessly to induct it into the National Film Registry, and I hope you all join me on that quest. This has been Garfield and Fine Art, a fireside chat with Wyatt Duncan. I'm Wyatt Duncan, God bless Garfield's Pet Force, and God bless Jim Davis. Heyo, hey guys, my flight leaves in a second, and I forgot to record the final transition of the video, so this is my best take. We're going to talk about the Bill Murray Garfield movies now. <laughs> Yay! It's no secret that the early 2000s Bill Murray Garfield movies are weird, inexplicable. Warning, collision, 20 seconds. Bad. But I feel inclined to defend Garfield's honor here, because I don't think his involvement has anything to do with the quality of the film. You see, Garfield movies were inspired by the Scooby-Doo movies. Garfield then inspired Alvin and the Chipmunks. Alvin and the Chipmunks then inspired the Smurfs, which inspired Hop, which was then remade scene by scene for the upcoming Sonic the Hedgehog movie. <laughs> These are a long string of movies that are pretty similar in every notable way. They have similar plot points, they look the same, they hit the same beats, but the main connecting force is that they're all really bad. Garfield was not the sickness. He was someone who got infected. His films were the side effect of a trend in Hollywood inspired by Cash that failed over and over again to turn anything out that was actually good. Everyone knows the story that Bill Murray agreed to do these films because he thought the film was being made by the Coen brothers, only for it to turn out that the person who had written it had a name one letter away from the Coen brothers. But I think the funnier part of that story was when he actually got to the booth where he had to record all his audio and he saw all the live action segments already recorded, and he immediately started rewriting all of his lines to make them funnier, a process which would take him several days just for 10 minute segments. And when he finally insisted to be able to watch the movie all the way through as it had originally been written, he was shocked by how terrible it was. Murray then tried very hard to interfere with the second film, only to have his involvement overturned behind his back over and over again. Because of this, that film is even more strange and disfigured, seeming even less like something out of the Garfield catalog. And as a reminder, previous stories we've talked about in this video have included a Garfield take on the plot to be movie, Garfield being reincarnated into terrifying monstrosities, and Garfield fighting alongside his interdimensional counterpart. Yet somehow, this is the movie that feels the least like Garfield. I'm more impressed than I am mad. This is a big, big hot take, but I think one of the main reasons that these films don't work and this world doesn't feel quite right is not that Garfield is wrong, but that John and Liz are. Seriously, most everyone who's watching this has seen these films. Think back to what these two were like. What character traits did they have? What memorable things did they do? The answer is that they're not interesting enough to actually have an answer to those questions. John and Liz were lovable characters with extremely overt and cartoonish personalities and an iconic dynamic, 
and they were made into very boring people not worth talking about. And Garfield is all about bouncing off of personalities, he delivers the punchline, he makes fun of whoever is around him. This would be like if you expected MST3K to make a funny commentary over a three hour collage of saltine crackers. Like, it's not their fault if that isn't funny. The plot of these two films is just ridiculously stupid. The first film was all about John bringing Odie home for the first time, only for Garfield to shun and bully him, mimicking the plot of several other films before this. However, an evil man who wants to use Odie to sell something kidnaps him, which causes Garfield to hunt him down and stop him, which is something that Garfield definitely should be doing in a movie. The second film was about the royal family having a cat that looks just like Garfield, but he almost gets killed by this Aristocat weirdo who I think is somewhere in the hierarchy of the throne but is somehow below this cat. And uh, Garfield and this cat get swapped and all sorts of hijinks happen, I think. Honestly, I didn't watch this one again. The filmmakers made the horrible choice to view Garfield not as a series of story which work because of dynamics that allow for the creation of charming stories, but as a sort of mascot to be used for advertising and to be elevated for that status. Thus, the two Garfield movies mainly set out to have Garfield do funny things and be an exciting action hero despite that not making sense, and because of that they end up having the coherence of a Disney Channel original movie. The biggest sin of the Bill Murray Garfield movies is that they don't have to be about Garfield. This could be a Tony the Tiger movie, it could be a Marmaduke movie, and it hurts to say this, but he could be a Heathcliff movie. And I feel bad that these films are a huge chunk of what Garfield is known for, because the poor quality of these two films revolve around factors that I think have nothing to do with him. That's sort of true for most Garfield movies. Time and time again it feels like what's been proven isn't that Garfield can't be a movie star, but that most people don't get why Garfield should be a movie star. Some of you might ask, Quentin, will there ever be a movie that truly captures the real essence of the comic? And to that all I can say is, let's hope and see. Did that sound cryptid? I wanted that to sound cryptid. Now that we're done talking about Garfield, do you know what I think I'm in the mood to do? I'd really like to binge some Rocco's Modern Life, especially since a sequel movie is about to come out. And now I have the chance to do that without paying a single dime. All I have to do is go to verve.co slash Quentin, where I can sign up for 30 free days of premium, and I'll be able to enjoy this incredible service. And I implore all of you to join me at vrv.co slash Q-U-I-N-T-O-N. And with that, I've been quitting reviews, and that's all you need.